It's Ports of Call Waterfront Dining, award-winning service and cuisine with a view of the dynamic L.A. Harbor from every seat. For reservations and directions, visit portsofcalldining.com or call 310-833-3553. Energize the Lawn Friend Podcast, Bad Company, The, and I use this word not that often to describe rock stars who are in their 60s who made such an impact decades ago, mostly in the 70s. Paul Rogers is as important a vocal presence in the history of rock, mainly because his pipes maintain over the decades. Some of the greats that we go see and pay big bucks because now they could they, they get whatever because you don't know how much longer they're going to be around, so super expensive. But hey, you want them to you want to hear the songs that 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 resemble, mirror, reflect, or are pretty close to the way you heard it when it gave you that that boner the first time right you listen to paul rogers in bad company now you go see him live they're so good give me silver blue and gold color of the sky i'm told my rainbow is overdue it's not just the melodies that it hits you it's the lyrics like a verse that verse I was riding my bike on a bike path on the east side of Vegas along this wash and meandering around these parks. And there's like no one out there but me. And, I, it, and I'm listening to Paul Rogers. I'm listening to Bad Company in this like 70s mixed channel on my Apple Music. And that song, I had to stop. I went, whoa, God, I haven't heard that song. He's singing to me. He, sing, he somehow magically through the power of iPod iPod technology <laughs> and streams and 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 the other thing in the ether that we don't understand that maybe Lao Tzu understood but other most people don't certainly politicians don't understand it that whoa God he is singing to me my rainbow is overdue so what happens to affirm that, you know, I'm seeing Marillion two days later. The next day I'm doing my podcast. And what does Mike Stark tell me as I'm pulling in? Look at this picture I took. And it's a photo of the rainbow over Port Sakal just before I arrived this evening. And pff, how's that for a segue? Harvey Kubernick, the legendary rock journalist, is calling in. Hey, Harv. Lonnie, how are you? Do you know the Bad Company song, Give Me Silver and Gold? Yes. The color of the sky, I'm told. My rainbow is overdue. I think all of us are overdue. <laughs> <laughs> you could... you. <laughs> Boy, that was kind of a metaphysical rap that you were laying out before I showed up. It was so refreshing to um, <laughs> hear you run that down because it did remind me of the promise of the early FM radio that I discovered as a teenager in Hollywood where I know it was called Progressive or Underground, but people had personality and yeah. made choices of music, but also they would talk to the listener. They wouldn't talk down to the listener. Exactly. And so that was kind of a groovy scene hearing about ports of call and you know, <laughs> I mean, wow. Give Ladies me, and gentlemen, me. you don't understand you this <laughs> this man has written how many books? Well, not enough because I'm still called a music journalist. I show up at your <laughs> no, show. you're an author. Can we can we finally get the coveted <laughs> author status? I I don't know how to promote anything. Peggy, a Schmendrick, <laughs> you know what I mean. You are an author, Thank and you are a historian, and 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 I love you for such a long time because <clears throat> you you are the Lester Bang character in the Cameron Crowe film because your lifestyle hasn't altered and you won't alter it because you're true to the. <clears throat> 
the story. It's interesting you mentioned Lester Bangs because I followed him at San Diego State when I went there in the early 70s, and he went there in the late 60s. And he had a reputation on campus. Uh, you know, his writings were in the library, or maybe he wrote for the school newspaper. He was from El Cajon, nearby San Diego. And I met Cameron Crowe when he was 14, 15, or 16 when he wrote for a paper down there called The Door. Um, awesome. But I always... Uh, so I appreciate the alignment. I only met Lester a couple of times. I'm, I'm thanked in the book on him that Jim DeRogatis did. Yeah. But um, I'm in it for the long haul, and as my dear physically departed friend Bobby Womack said to me more than once, we're all messengers, although sometimes I don't dig the message. Yeah. And so we're here to, um, I think both of us and the people who check out your deal, um, are here for the music and the journey and the trek and the reality because there's just so much confusion and chaos and diversion and yep. out there that we all kind of need to bond together. Where, the, the, the similarity from two sort of different eras, but nevertheless you lived through, because you're a little older than me, mm -hmm. but the fact that you can tell a Stones rehearsal story in 2016, like I can tell a Marillion at the Rainbow story. <laughs> you need to share how you wound up watching the Stones rehearse not too long ago, right? Right, and again, thank you for asking. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not here to, uh, you know, it's, it's a moment that has made my phone ring and my emails happen. <laughs> Of both worship, envy, hatred, taunting. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You've been through all of it. Yeah, sure. It's sort of like when you were babysitting at the Metallica Black Album session. Yeah. A lot of people want that seat, and you can't get it at StubHub, can you? <laughs> no, not even for the Gene Simmons coveted VIP ticket. <laughs> um. Anyways, the Cliff Notes version okay. is... Um, I've known this band for many years. I've seen them since the late 60s. I've reviewed them or written stories about them and published things on them as early as 1974-75. I've interviewed a few of the members of the group, whether it be, you know, Bill Wyman or when Billy Billy Preston was playing with them and um about 20 years ago, I connected with Charlie Watts through the drummer Jim Keltner. Mm -hmm. And um, Charlie and I just, um, well, rule number one, if you talk to Charlie Watts or meet him, you don't talk stones, you talk jazz. Okay. Okay? Rule number one, if you meet a Beatle, don't talk about the Beatles. <laughs> you know? You, you, you'll eventually get your Beatle question in, but you got to bring something different to the table. Of course. Okay, that being said, um, Charlie provided a, a blurb on a... Um, a spoken word album I produced on the jazz, iconic jazz man, uh, Buddy Colette, because Charlie is a big fan of West Coast jazz. And in conversations with me, uh, with Keltner, sometimes during the Bridges to Babylon recording sessions, I was, come on down to the studio. Sure. Um, I was able to answer some West Coast jazz questions, whether it be about Shelley Mann, the drummer, mm -hmm. or his venue, Shelley's Manhole, or various clubs around town, and um, um, it was an interest because it was music. Right. Um, so the the interesting thing, this all bleeds into it, I, I sort of cracked the inner sanctum because I've been writing about the Stones in places like Record Collector News Magazine mm -hmm. or Cave Hollywood or Mix Magazine. I did an interview with the producer, uh, Don Was, for Mix Magazine, and I'm just not doing the casualty kink story on the Rolling Stones. Well, this is about relationship building, too, which is how a journalist who's not part of the family, because it's usually only family members that these icons let in. Right. And, and, and so... Um, so you reconnected with I Charlie reconnected recently. And, then Char and on the last tour, I mean, Charlie would actually call and invite me to, mm -hmm. to the gigs. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I'd pay, you know, and sit and, and sit with the the public, and yeah. then sometimes I'm fully comped, and yeah. you've been through that one. Yeah. I like both perspectives. Right. So uh, when the Stones were coming to town, through his assistant and and Jim Keltner and Charlie, 
oh, Charlie's in town. Uh, why don't you, you know, meet us at a restaurant? Um, I don't want to say the name of the right. restaurant, but but I said no, I'm working. I have to make a living. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, listen, now they're rehearsing. Don't you live in the valley? Yeah, I'm I'm in the valley. Sure. Uh, you know, Burbank, whatever. Well, hey, the, the you know the Stones are rehearsing down the street from you. Okay. Uh, I'm sure Charlie will you know or his assistant will give you a call. Okay. Why don't you come on down? Right. And um, and so I got the phone call. I mean, this is one of the times where people all what you expect people to either flake on you or not deliver. But they didn't flake, and you walked in, and what did you see? Well, Just tell us I, what I you saw. Called. Listen, I'm smart enough not to bring women or anybody right. with me. That's rule number one. Okay. You, you, this is a solo flight. Okay. B. Because it's, it's, it's sacred, hallowed ground. <laughs> yes, but there's also seven checkpoint Charlies and and limousines and security. Moses didn't have Sephra with him with, when he saw the burning bush on Mount Sinai. He so did that any, anyways, solo. Anyways, I, I come come on down. And and the thing is, <laughs> and and I hope your listeners and I hate to I'm dragging this thing out, but I mean, yeah, this radio stop dragging. Okay, but but the thing is, I happen to be in a Stones circle right now, where I was just on BBC television with Ronnie Wood on an hour-long documentary on Bobby Womack. I'm doing some work on a documentary on the arranger, producer, composer Jack Nietzsche that Keith Richard was just... Filming. Harvey, what did you see when you walked well, anyways, into the studio? They, I know the group from just... Um, Harvey, what did you see? What did you see? In rehearsal, I saw, okay. I saw people work through tunes. Right. What songs did they rehearse while you were there? Well, it was, it was interesting. They had about 40 songs on... A big board, okay. That they were rehearsing for their Coachella dates, and I know that they were going to mix up the sets, okay. At least to have a, a few different tunes the second weekend, okay. And one of the interesting images I have is Jagger has got a harmonica in one hand and this small kind of laptop on the other that has lyrics and song titles, okay. So. They're working out the tunes. The tempos are slow, right? And everybody's there, and they do a couple songs. And there's a break, and you get some water. It's not party city. What song did you hear? Give us one song. I saw twelve songs. Well, give me one that you heard that that stood out, and you said, Fuck, "This is going to be great to see live." Which one? Something maybe they refreshed or approached with a slightly new beat or. I, I got to hear Rocks Off with and without the horn parts. And that was interesting because I'm, in I'm in a big XL Main Street thing right now. Mm -hmm. um, I got to hear things like Fool to Cry. I got Keith and Ronnie did an acoustic. You got the silver in front of me. Nice. And, um, now you're talking. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was like uh, five feet from Charlie, and I was kind of tapping my foot or kind of touching a tambourine. And I sing, you know what? I'm jamming with the Stones. <laughs> and and Keltner is like kind of kicking me in the ribs a bit because Keltner, Keltner, uh, you know, it's funny. That you nailed it right there, dude. And, and, and the thing is, but then again, during the break, Keltner brought in, and this, this is like a total Lukather thing that only you would worship. Keltner says, hold on, I've got a like a big Zildjian symbol, a pasty symbol in my car. So he was bringing in like symbols and hi-hats for Charlie <laughs> to try out. So I was just kind of, it was like my own NAM convention. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like talking about Charlie, and I said, um... I didn't know you play 7A sticks, because, you know, I can do Musician Institute rap, okay? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, and I said, those are thick sticks like, and we both said, Joe Morello. <sighs> and I said, yeah, and then I said, uh, but I thought you were a, a guy that really liked, I mean, you love Chico Hamilton, and, and you know, you love Shelly Mann. And he said, well, Shelly sticks were, had, were very thin at the end. <laughs> And so I'm having this I'm having this drum talk with with Charlie Watts. Yes, but you have to understand. Ten years ago, I sent him a book on Shelley Man. He doesn't forget these. I things. think this is why we are blessed sometimes, because you know when I'm watching the Black Record get tracked, and James Hetfield is showing me how he gets the sound out of his guitar, and if he says, "Lon, this is called the Tent of Doom. Nobody from the outside sees this." And I and and what 
we get to witness, bear witness to, we need to communicate that to the fans because it's the fans that don't really know what well, the creative think, process is all about. I think what has really happened, the musicality and the instrumentation aspect yeah. of rock and roll has been delegated to like Bass Magazine or Mix Magazine, technical journals and great, the wonderful things like that. But we're not musicians, you and me. No, and that's the, the thing is, Keltner said to me, man, you get to sit at the drummer's table. <laughs> And, and I said, wow. Wow. And, and I, but, but you have to understand one other thing about me. I've been on sessions with Jim Keltner, albeit on tambourine and percussion, on <laughs> Phil Spector recording dates with the Ramones and the Paley Brothers. So I've been at, uh, tracking with him and Terry Gibbs and, and Bill Pullman and these, these wrecking crew veterans, Don Randy, Hal Blaine. Yeah. So, you know, he knew me 30 years ago as a food runner and a percussionist on, on you know, real 24-track sessions. Takes a lot to get into that room oh, in no, 2016. No, no, let me tell you something, but you need, you need to know this thing. Okay. Keith was, first yeah. of all... Where was, what was Keith well, about? Okay, I'll give you the thumbnail this stuff. Thumbnail, because then we're going to play some stones. Okay. we, we got to move, move into the ether uh, of the stones. Deal. Mick was friendly, but yeah. he's running the thing. Okay. It was interesting at rehearsals, the songs drag longer, and Jagger at a few different times asked for Charlie to do a lot more ride cymbal, where the things kind of grooved and faded out. That's cool. And that was kind of, that was interesting. <clears throat> now follow this one, because you, I'll give you the thumbnails on everybody. You know, I forget, where I feel like I'm talking to you on the phone, but there are people <laughs> You know what? And I, 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 Highest compliment you could pay me. <laughs> okay, let me let me lay this on because I'm not going to run this down to anybody else on the radio. But I'll give it to you. I walk in there. There's Daryl Jones. Yep. He says hi. How are you? Because I sat with his brother okay. on the last Stones gig, and I said, "By the way, I was watching ESPN, and Mike Wilbon I, I mentioned your name." <laughs> And he said, oh, really? I said, yeah, Mike Wilbon in the middle of some argument with Tony Kornheiser says, <laughs> says yeah, I, I'm, I, I, one of my partners who I grew up in Chicago with is in the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and, and I said, what, do you know Mike Wilbon? He said, oh, he grew up with my brother before he went there to the Western. Go. There you go. So there was a, like a whole Chicago thing. Sure. And the Cubs are in the World Series. Yeah. It's all connected, man. Now, follow this. Then Ronnie Wood points to me. Okay. He runs over. Yep. And he said, "Writer man, <laughs> man." I didn't. You know, and I said, "I'm sorry." He said, "Writer man, telly man." <laughs> and I said, "That's right," because we we were on and featured in this hour BBC thing on Ronnie Wood, one of his people. <laughs> Dude, that's the essence of it right there. Okay. The line out of his mouth. Yeah. So he so so he said to me, <laughs> "Do you still talk to Rodney Bingenheimer?" Right. And I said, yeah, all the time. Yeah. And then Rodney said, uh, Woody said, oh, give him my love, you know. And I said, uh, uh, this is the best line of the night. <laughs> I said, you know, Rodney told me that he picked up the faces uh, in 1971, 1970 and 71, when Rod was on Mercury for a solo album. And him and his mother in his mother's car picked up the faces at the airport <laughs> <for a> promo <laughs> gig. <laughs> And and then anyway, so and I said Ronnie, and he introduced me to his wife, and his he's yeah. had new twins. And yeah. met, you know, you're meeting all the kids. You yeah. understand that? Yeah. And, Ron, and Ronnie's going, yeah. What do you think of the Stones thing, man? I haven't really seen you here before. And I said, let me tell you something. <laughs> I really needed this yeah. mitzvah. Yeah. What's that mean? <laughs> I said I needed I needed this visitation because I yeah. really got mauled this week by the music. It's a blessing. And he said, and he said, yeah, well, you know, I always knew I was going to be in the Rolling Stones when I saw them at Hyde Park in '69. I said the Rolling Stones are cool, Ronnie, but let's be straight on one thing. It's not lost on me that you're the bass player on Jeff Beck's Truth album. <laughs> And he grabs me by my hand and takes me in another room to go meet his new twin. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting the nanny and the whole... Oh, I, I look his it. Keith, Keith is, like, telepathic. Yeah. Keith sees the whole scenario. Yeah. So, so Keith comes by, yes. and, you know, we're reintroduced, and he knows me, and I and talk about Jack Nietzsche. And we'll, yeah, yeah. What does he say? Well... What's his gem? I said to him, "This is this is this lawn friend 
psychic <laughs> geography okay. thing. All right. That I knew that I deserved this thing. Okay. And I knew that I was there not as a reporter per se. Right. Just cemented glue of my journey or yeah, something. Yeah, that's right. Karma. You're there I with karma. I said to him, um, did you read my book? I said, oh, of course. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I'm, I said, I just wrote a big cover story um, that's coming out, Record Collector News. And I said, I know you like the last one because there's a picture of him reading. Yep. The, you know, that's all over the world and everything. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, I was really blown away that you mentioned Lenny Bruce in your book. And you learned a lot about American culture through Lenny Bruce because I don't really read that stuff in any interviews mm -hmm. ever with you. He said, oh, Lenny, oh, yeah, the records, the comedy thing. Oh, incredible. <laughs> so I said, by the way... Um, there's, you know, one of your songs has a line from a Lenny Bruce routine. I think it's called The Comedian at the Palladium, where the agent says to Lenny Bruce, I can't get you a booking at the Palladium or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm having some work done at my house. The pool's in and the patio ain't dry. That's <laughs> what the agent says to Lenny in this kind of okay. comedy bit. Okay. So I said, yeah, there's a, a, I heard a, a few words uh, in this comedy bit that is one of your songs. He said, oh, oh really, huh? Really, huh? <laughs> and I said, yeah. I wasn't busting him on a nick. It, it was only about six words total. Do you understand? Really, huh? Uh, yeah. He said, oh, yeah. They get it. Thumbs up, lad, and, and all that. And then, and then, so they're doing the rehearsal, and then him and Ronnie do, we got, you got the silk yes, together yes. acoustically. Yes, yes. Awesome. And then awesome. all of a sudden, Ronnie goes, what else are you going to do? Because Mick would take some breaks because there was some Keith things, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, Keith kicks into the song a little T and A. Right. Where the great riff the song. Yeah. Where he goes, the pool's in and the patio ain't dry. <laughs> so he turns and he flips his pick at me. <laughs> and then Ronnie sees it, and Ronnie comes over and he hands me one of his picks. <laughs> and I said to Keltner, "I believe I have to leave right now." <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> The one and only Harvey Kubernick, author, historian, as awesome and original as it gets. They broke the mold, and he still has all of his hair, which is ridiculous because he's like mid-60s. Yeah. So the hell with you. Let's listen to some Stones. Thanks. This is Energize, the Lawn Friend Podcast. Love you, Harvey. Thank you, man. Bye-bye.